Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here. It's really wonderful to be home in Vermont. Uh, and this is a terrific rotary meal, and I understand we've got some inside uh, inside influence here in getting that done. You know, I was talking to Jerry. I was going to tell you what a great job I'm doing, you know, and things I'm working on. And I uh, mentioned this to Jerry. He says, get real. He goes, <laughs> he goes, people think Congress is dysfunctional and not working. And you know what? I know you're right. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk a little bit about Irene. I want to talk uh, very uh, briefly about the, uh, the financial sector and the battle that's going on. Number one, the good news story. It was an amazing, amazing experience as a member of Congress to travel around Vermont right after the hurricane and to see what the response was from the Vermonters. It truly was astonishing. The devastation, as you know, was just unbelievable. The power and the wrath of this storm uh, and the, the, the destruction that it inflicted up Route 100, across Route 4, uh, Route 9, uh, Moortown, uh, uh, Waterbury, you, uh, you, you saw it. And what was amazing to me was every Vermonter that I saw, they had one question, what can I do? How can I help? That was the orientation of Vermonters who were lucky not to have been hurt. And then folks who were hammered, I met this man in Pittsfield, that town was cut off to the north, cut off to the south, Kids couldn't get out. The parents got chainsaws and they made a half mile uh, path so kids could ultimately get up to go to school. And while they were waiting, they actually set up a school on the green. And the kids were like happy and secure because even though there was damage to homes and everything around, the parents made them feel so secure and just life went on. It's normal. I asked one of the kids how it's going. They said, We had helicopters here. And I, get, I said, Blackhawk? He goes, No, Chinooks. <laughs> it was unbelievable. But I met this man in Pittsfield. And his house was about 200 yards from the river. And the river changed course. It got dammed up, and it literally acted as though it had GPS to go to his house. And it took, it swept half of his house away. The other half was collapsed. And two and a half of his three and a half acres were gone. And I mean gone, not that it had debris on it. It was totally wiped out. And I couldn't believe, and he just got off the phone with the insurance agent who told him, no, he doesn't have flood insurance, right? And I, I didn't know what to do, because whatever we can do with FEMA, it's not going to be enough. And you know what his attitude was? Oh, Pete, it's worse for the guy down the, down the street. No matter what damage Vermonters suffered, their concern was that somebody had it worse. That was the attitude that Vermonters had. It was just extraordinary. So we have a challenge, obviously, Senator Lake, Senator Sanders, and I, <clears throat> to make sure that the FEMA money, the federal highway money, and the farm money is fully funded because it's time that Vermont needs that help in order to rebuild. Vermonters are doing their share. And our people in Vermont, no one ever has complained to me about Vermonters having to help pay uh, to put people back on their feet after Katrina, after the floods in Iowa, uh, on the Rogue River up in North Dakota. We always show up to help. And you know what? At the end of the day, we're going to have to pay for this. But you don't have an argument about 435 different ways to pay for it when the river's rising or the house is burning. So what I put together in Washington is an Irene coalition, which is Democrats and Republicans, because the storm uh, played no favorites, no partisan favorites whatsoever. Whoever was in the way is the one who got hammered. And my hope is that not only will be be successful by having over 30 Democrats and about 25 Republicans working together, but it might be a way of showing that working together is a better way to get things done. Secondly, the, uh, the financial uh, situation. I was going to, maybe we, there's two different models about the, the, the financial services. You know, the, 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 economy, the economy that we're in right now is largely a result of a financial collapse. <clears throat> we all know that. Largely practices uh, of excessive indebtedness, a lot of Wall Street practices, it wasn't practices on Main Street. And what we really have are two different business models. You know, the top four banks um, have among them $7.7 trillion. And they do provide some consumer lending, but they also serve as enormous trading platforms, buying and selling uh, derivatives, buying and selling uh, currencies, doing all of these things that are traditionally associated with trading, which is fine, but it's different than consumer banking. And what we have in Vermont with our community banks, with our financial services sector, with our credit unions, 
is a model that's based on good service, good quality, competitive pricing, and the bankers I know are like the late Rick Manahan of uh, People's Trust up in Franklin County. This is a local community bank where when you walk in, you met Rick, he was seated at a desk as you walked right in the bank. He was the one who was reading you because he wanted to know what was going on with his customers. And at the height of the financial crisis, which also coincided with the roughest time our dairy farmers have had, Rick would call me up, and it would never be to ask for a favor or to tell me some kind of special pleading that he thought we needed for banks or anything else. It was, Peter, we have got to help our farmers. He was out on the farms finding ways to try to keep them going. And he had to do it within the rules, he had to do it in the real world, uh, but he wanted to do it. And his plea to me was to do whatever we could in Congress to help move that along. So the bankers that I've met here, the, 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 they feel good at the end of the day when they know they've actually given a loan to a local business that's going to create a job or two. When a young family is buying their first home, they're able to get them a mortgage and they treat them fair and square. That's what makes them feel good. Not this fee-driven system where your massive market power allows you to use computers to slice and dice and figure out ways where you can reach into the pocket of your depositor, reach into the pocket, the pocket of the consumers, and then provide more money for the trading platform. That's a different agenda. It's a different approach. And what I think we need is a very strong banking sector, financial sector. You can't have a good, strong capitalist economy without lenders who are helping those businesses and those families move ahead. But it's got to be based on what I would call much more of a Vermont model of how I can help you rather than what are you going to do for me. Now, the financial sector, this, Jerry and I were talking earlier and then we were discussing this over at the table. Congress did an enormous amount of damage to America's confidence in itself with the way it handled the debt ceiling debate in August. That, in my view, was a disaster because the premise of the whole debate was that it was actually optional whether we pay our bills. Now, can you imagine anybody in Vermont working over at the State House, Republican or Democrat, legislator or governor, actually pretending as though we had an option as to whether we would pay the bills that have been incurred by previous governors and previous legislators. And it might be some expenditures that we voted against. You know, I was against the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan. It cost a lot of money. I was against some of those push tax cuts. But you know what? We owe the money. We have to pay the money. The damage of pretending that this was optional. And then to use that as political leverage to try to get your way on the budget did enormous damage to this country. So the challenge we have is actually solvable. This is the aspect of it uh, that, that I think, when I talk to folks, really upsets them. We've got a long-term budget uh, a, 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 a challenge that has to be brought back into balance. We know that. And we do have to get back into balance. But reasonable people know that if you're going to get there, we've got to give and we've got to take. And it's going to take Democrats being willing to make some cuts. It's going to take Republicans be willing to raise some revenues. And it's going to be to achieve the common goal of getting fiscal stability. And Congress has to have some capacity to work together to make decisions and to give people some confidence that that institution, which is entrusted with responsibility to make some of these decisions, will in fact make them. And making decisions and moving in a direction that's steady and <coughs> sure uh, and sustainable is what we have to do. So my goal in Congress is to do everything I possibly can to find some practical common sense solutions that require an acknowledgement that both sides have to be willing to give, that both sides have to be willing to take. We're having another, uh, of course the, the super committee is now meeting, and I'm part of the group on the House side, Democrats and Republicans, that's signing a letter to that committee saying <coughs> everything should be on the table, and the breakthrough here is that some of the Republicans who will sign this, it's not finalized yet, but they're acknowledging that revenues have to be on the table. All of us on the Democratic side are acknowledging that all the spending has to be on the table. That means reforms in even the entitlement programs. I say that as a person who's a strong defender of Medicare, a strong defender of Social Security, but if you're a strong defender, and there's ways to make it improve it, to make it more sustainable, I feel that I have the major responsibility as your representative <coughs> to search and fight for those ways to do that. So that's the challenge. Will we be successful? I don't know. 
but here's what I know. As long as I'm your member of Congress, I'm gonna stay in that fight, and that fight has to do with the Vermont way, where we understand with mutual respect that both sides frequently have a pretty good point of view, and if you work together, you can find some common ground and make some progress. So let me stop there uh, and open it up for questions, but I wanna thank you all very much for letting me join you today.
and you'd have revenues. And both sides would be getting something in exchange for giving up something. And what we would all be getting would be something that we could identify as beneficial to uh, America. So he had the inclination to do that, but then we had no ability within his caucus to get support to do it. So that does not bode real well. Now this letter I mentioned that is going to be bipartisan, we're asking this super committee to go big and go bold, to go for four trillion. And obviously that requires everything to be on the table. So there's a lot of us who are pushing for that. You know, when I talk to Vermonters, they, they just kind of get it. They know, you know, you've got a real problem. If you approach this as a practical problem to be solved, rather than an ideological battle to be won, well, then you can solve it. You know, if, 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 how many businesses, you know, after 08, they had to sit down and look at their bottom line. They had to make tough cuts, but they also had to decide where to invest because they knew that there were emerging opportunities and if they sat on the sidelines too long, they wouldn't be strong. And that's a hard, chilling decision to make, but it's both, both sides. So I don't have a prediction, but it's important for the country that 